Hey, this is Brent Jensen. You're listening to No Sleep Till Sudbury, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. The show is brought to you by Priya Pickups. What you want, what you need, what you love. Check them out at priapickups.com. The show is also brought to you by Fleming Properties. Steve Fleming is one of my best pals. And if you're looking to buy or sell your home in Canada or the USA, reach out to Steve at FlemingProperties.com. Lastly, don't forget to check out Thursday Night Record Club on the Brent Jensen Music YouTube channel. Today on No Sleep Till Sudbury, I welcome Chris Sisom, a music executive who's held senior positions with Chorus Entertainment and 102.1 The Edge, and is currently doing all sorts of fun stuff in the music industry that I'm looking forward to speaking to him about. Here he is, folks. Chris Sisom. Chris, welcome to the show. I appreciate you taking the time. Well, thanks so much, Brent. That uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So now you know a thing or two about music, having worked in the industry uh, in different capacities for, I think, almost 30 years now. In addition to your roles at Chorus and The Edge, you, you also managed a, a 90s pop band called Wild Strawberries. Is that right? I did. Yeah, yeah. I, I I met them through during my time at the Edge, mm-hmm. and uh, Ken and Roberta Harrison. They're actually a married couple who started to ban pre-marriage uh, and called Wild Strawberries, and uh, they had a couple of gold records in Canada during my time with them. And uh, really great people, and wrote some really nice pop songs. They did, yeah. So now let's talk about some of the things that you're currently involved in. I think you're doing some fun stuff in the industry now, aren't you? Well, I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing a couple of things. First, I'm doing uh, my own consulting work in general with media companies and helping them with strategic planning and operations and mm-hmm. uh, whatever whatever their needs are. And then the second thing, I'm involved with a startup called Music Royalties Inc. Mm. And Music Royalties Inc. We've raised. Uh, it started by the founder, a guy named Tim Gallagher. Interesting background. He came from the mining royalties business, and uh, which was his industry for 20 years Mm -hmm. and uh he got out of that and was looking for what he thought would be the next big royalty business and this is about five plus years ago and he was a music fan but not a fanatical music fan just an average music fan so at the time he came across music as a as a royalty option as one of the options he looked at Mm -hmm. and he thought that it was the biggest opportunity for the royalties going forward so he asked uh, me to help him out at the time and a couple other uh, people who were more mu- music related and, and and more music experience. And uh, so far, we've raised uh, over $20 million and oh, bought wow. uh, pieces of catalogs from from the Rolling Stones to Cage the Elephant mm-hmm. to uh, Empire State of Mind by uh, Jay-Z and uh, Alicia Keys, a piece of the entire Eminem catalog as well. Oh, wow. And it sounds really huge. The, the strategy from all of these is to buy a small percentage. In general, these are all like 2%, 3% mm-hmm. of a catalog. So it, it acts more like a dividend. So if you own 1% of the M&M catalog, which we bought from one of his producers, you basically, your, your biggest priorities are to collections and legal. Because whoever owns that catalog, let's say it's Universal Music, they're they're the people who are out placing songs in movies and TV and making sure they're all on Spotify and Amazon Prime and Apple Music, et cetera. And and they're doing all the marketing and promotion. So we're 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 looking for those small percentages of well known catalogs to uh, grow with them. Twenty years ago, Napster came out and basically right. crush crushed the music business because the music business wasn't smart enough to license with Napster. In fact, the only company that did was BMG, but the rest of the record companies sued them and Napster and put them <laughs> so that they couldn't do it. So so it took the music business 20 years to figure out how to monetize digital. And that, of course, happened with Apple Music and Spotify and right. uh, Amazon, Amazon Music, etc. So right now, Music industry revenues are, are going up by leaps and bounds annually because uh, uh, of the uh, monetization of, of digital. Very interesting concept. How do you come about finding out that Eminem is willing to sell or his producer is willing to sell off 2% of the, the catalog? Well, there's a number of ways. There's, there's agents who are out uh, 
trying to sell pieces of catalogs. And there's also uh, numerous auction sites mm -hmm. where you can go and, and see what's available. And a matter of fact, I think that the M&M one, if I recall correctly, was bought off an auction site. You know, and you're looking at what the, the history uh, of what the royalties were for that. And you can look back over the last number of years and say, okay, if it's if it's ten thousand dollars a year for that one percent, let's just say, you know, hopefully the next year it's going to be eleven thousand and twelve thousand, et cetera, as, as right. we move forward. Right now, there's there's not a lot of downside to music royalties. You hear people complain about Spotify and Apple Music and some artists, but it, this incredibly amount of money they're putting towards it is about sixty five percent of their gross revenue goes to goes to uh, rights holders. Oh, really? So, I didn't know that. And it's, so it's a, it's a significant percentage. But of course, the record companies are pretty smart about this. So all their deals now, of course, take a percentage of that from the artist. Of course. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so that's, and that's, so, so that's why you hear the artists complain about Spotify when, or Apple Music when in reality they should be complaining about their own record companies, probably. Yeah. Oh, they're always going to get paid. The record company always gets paid. Right? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah. So it's it's been it's been an interesting process, and you know I I'm just a small shareholder in this whole thing, but it's uh, it's been fun working on it and seeing what we can find and yeah and what you know people are willing to sell. So now are, are are there artists that Chris Sysom is actively looking for? <laughs> um. <laughs> No, I wouldn't say that. I, I would, you know, you're always looking for opportunities. You're just lucky when they come along and, and that you, you can perhaps uh, make it work. But yes, we're looking for pretty much recognizable catalogs or pieces of catalogs. So, you know, when I talk about the artists, I mean, Dire Straits is another one that we mm. bought a piece from their, from their manager. And so many people own songs. Every song is owned by at least 10 people. Oh, and really? Oh yeah. Oh. You just, you just go back to, if you look at a song by Drake mm -hmm. or someone like that, I mean, there's like 10 songwriters alone, let alone the music, uh, the record company, the publishing company, his management company, mm. and, and manager, the producer and the writers all get paid. Right. And so the, the, it's, it's divided up quite widely. I didn't know that it was that involved. I thought the producer maybe, you know, at the end of his gig got paid, you know, and yeah. it was just kind of a set fee and off you go kind of thing. But I guess they work out deals in, in perpetuity and stuff too, right? That's right. In general, mm. yeah, a producer gets percentage points on the whole as as well as getting an upfront payment. Mm. Mm. And, you know, it's a big producer if it's, uh, you know, Brian Eno or, or Mutt Lang. Yeah, they're getting, they're getting a huge <laughs> fee and a significant percentage. Oh, so much money! Yeah, <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, it'd be pretty cool though to if you had someone like a, you know one of your favorite artists, knowing that you you owned a small percentage of their catalog. It's kind of cool. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I would have been, I would have been on, been on the Springsteen catalog, but it it was five hundred and fifty million U.S. So I, was... <laughs> d d yeah, I was gonna say, did he not just sell that whole thing? He did. Didn't yeah, he? he sold. He sold his percentage. Right. So, oh. and he sold it to Sony Music, who owned the other significant part of it, since that's been his record label. Oh, so it was worth more than that. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. That is crazy. Wow. Mm -hmm. Not bad for a kid from New Jersey. <laughs> huh? No kidding. <laughs> wow. Isn't that unbelievable? Jeez. Anyway, well, that's a good segue, Chris, into your songs. Because they kick off with the boss, Bruce Springsteen. Jungle Land is your first pick. Yeah, it, it's certainly, well, let me just say, first off, it was very hard to narrow it down to songs. So I tried to figure out some sort of stories and categories and where I was going. And uh, Springsteen is certainly one of my favorite artists. I've seen him live more than any other artist mm. uh, and many, many, many times. But the first time I saw him live was in 1980 at Maple Leaf Gardens with my girlfriend who eventually became my wife. What intrigued me about the song is just the changes in the song and the sax solo by Clarence Clemens oh, yeah. about three to four minutes in is, is one of the best, most moving pieces of music, particularly, unfortunately, with the demise of the big man. Mm -hmm. 
to me, it's just a, such a moving uh, solo and uh, fits so well with the song. And, you know, it, it's almost like Bruce just <laughs> hands it over to him and says, oh, Clarence, take it from here. To me, it's just brilliant. I've, I've never gotten sick of that song. And it's just one of those songs where it just makes you stand up and sway or, you know, even sitting down and sway and, and listen to it. And to me, it moves me like the, as the songs, you, as you said, made you skin move, I think is how you describe skin it. Skin vibrate, yeah. Skin vibrate, yes. And that is that is one of the best. It, it's I, I love this song too, and I'm a huge Springsteen fan. So like a, a perfect end to an incredible record. I, somebody told me once that, that Clemens spent... 16 hours playing the solo over and over again under the watchful eye of Springsteen, like you know, saying, no, dude, you got no, dude, 16 hours. And somebody said, do you have like, how did you get through that? And he said, a lot of weed, man. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, well, such a, it's such a great oh, solo, right? Yeah, it sure is. Well, Springsteen is, is the, one of the ultimate perfections. Oh yeah. When it comes to music. And I remember reading about the East street band and, and maybe it was in Clarence's biography. He, he said, so here's how, here's how rehearsal works. If rehearsal is at 1 p.m., mm-hmm. the band is on, their, on the stage with instruments on two minutes before one. Mm-hmm. Because Springsteen gets there at one and wants to play. Wow. So, he said that's the demand of Bruce Springsteen and why he's so well rehearsed to can play anything at any time. He's, uh, he's on tour now, and I'm sure that you know, it's different. They change the set list every night. Oh, a lot of it stays the same, but he changes it all the time. I love that. He, he had his, the last one of the times I saw him in the last 10 years, 12 years. He's, mm-hmm. He, uh, it was this tour, and basically, the, what happened on the tour, people started bringing signs and he'd do sign requests during the tour. Oh. <laughs> and at, at Scotiabank, someone had a sign. That had two he- two lit headlights on it, okay. and and the sign and it said "Racing in the Street" with the two headlights, <laughs> and so he would collect. He would have security collect the sign and bring it up on stage, and he just looked at that and says, "I gotta play this. Look at this sign." <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah, I so love that. It's pretty cool. You know, you hear about all these these idiotic things that are going on with you know tape usage and stuff like that, and it's so. It's such a great feeling to know that Springsteen, especially given his age, is going out there and just knocking it out every night without any of that nonsense. Yeah, you know? yeah, it, it certainly is. And and you know, it's rock and roll. It's not perfect. It's mm-hmm. moving. He brings it every night. It's better when it's not perfect. You know. Yeah. That's the, <laughs> the that's the you think about the old Rolling Stones. Like that's my kind of rock and roll. When it's I want to hear yeah. the the mistakes. That's that that adds the charm for me. Yeah, so, you're so right. Now, uh, your next, th- see, this is tricky because people say, you know, I had a really hard time narrowing it down to five songs and people get creative with like honorable <laughs> mentions and stuff like that. But nobody, Chris, has has attempted what you've attempted here, a tie. <laughs> so this is the first <laughs> time in like 250 episodes that, you know, it's like a tie for second <laughs> super trap <laughs> and the eagles so school in hotel california well done <laughs> <laughs> well thank you um i was thinking back to um the first shows i ever saw as a teenager Th- these were in 1977 in maple leaf gardens and they're literally two months apart mm, wow like six six or eight weeks apart 1977 hotel california the hotel california Eagles tour and the and the Super Tramp tour. And I, I don't even think it was the Crying of the Century tour. I think it was even in the quietest moments because I looked it up. And and so these were really my first ever concert experiences. Mm-hmm. And one of my best friends, Tim and I, lined up overnight at Maple Leaf Gardens to buy tickets to the Eagles for Hotel California. Mm-hmm. And it, <laughs> and we got first row greens. <laughs> which if you remember the time, I mean, there was golds, reds, blues, greens. So, so way <laughs> up there. We, we were a good way up, but we were close to the stage. So we weren't at the back. We were near the front. So they actually were really, were pretty good. And so we get there and, and we're so excited. And literally they open with Hotel California. Oh. And uh, it's their brand new record. 
and this is the song that you're hearing on radio and they open with hotel california wow and it was so unbelievable for our first concert experience like this and then follow it up literally six or eight weeks later with super tramp and they opened with school oh and i'm going, and I'm going my god these guys these are their would end up being two of their most iconic songs hotel california and school yeah and you know most artists would save them till the end mm -hmm. and these guys opened with them if you can imagine the drama because the hotel california is the iconic guitar opening and school it's the iconic piano uh solo and opening and with that uh, little scream right before the yeah 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 and and they basically uh, open their shows with it and it was quite traumatic how they did it for both of them the super tramp was simply a spotlight on a miniature piano and the came and played the miniature piano it was very interesting wow and it was fantastic and and so that's why i put them in as a tie because they were basically <laughs> more or less the same story they showed me the power of live music and and, and how much it added to listening to music to throw in live music and from seeing those shows i've gone to see you know hundreds of shows uh over the years because of my love of live music and it was initiated by those two shows wow now in addition to those chris what's another one that stands out that jumps out right now in your recollection <laughs> i saw the eagles right before the pandemic and don henley uh who's a, a bit of a crusty guy uh, he says, he says, tickets at eight o'clock comes out like third song in is take it easy. And it's being sun, sung by uh, Glenn Fry's son mm -hmm. who has taken over in the band since Glenn died. One of the new additions to the band and people are still coming in. And so at the end of the song, then Don Henley goes, well, welcome to all you newbies. Uh, the ticket did say we start at eight. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, sorry, Dad. Uh, but look, it's some some of the best shows that I've ever seen. Um, so many. Tragically, hit with the horseshoe. Mm. <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, the Foo, Foo Fighters at the Phoenix. Wow. Um, the, the, all sort of their on the up up and coming. That was the Foo Fighters' first record, and nobody thought you know David Grohl was going to be anything after Nirvana. And he came mm. out from a drummer, became a frontman, and just became a pretty iconic frontman. Yeah. Um, gosh, uh, so many great, great shows. I did, we did when I was with the edge, we did edge fest for many years yeah. at Molson park and Barry yeah. and some of the, some of the shows there, uh, with green day, with our lady peace, with uh, violent films and just spectacular shows. Wow. Um, so I did, I've been very fortunate to, to go to uh, many, many hundreds of shows. Mm. And so I, I would, there haven't been very many that have been disappointing, honestly. It's, it's been just a lot of fun. That's great. I have a funny story about a show. Your next artist here, Billy Bragg, I saw him at the yes. Danforth. And uh, okay. the, so the, the song is called uh, Greetings to the New Brunette, but very quick story about Billy. So I saw him at the Danforth. You know, they can they can take seats out, but they can put seats in at the Danforth, yeah. as you know. And so the seats were in, and I thought, wow, this is kind of nice. You know, it's I, you always stand up, right? Yeah. So Billy comes out, and we had been sitting down. He comes out, and everybody like, stands up really quickly, you know. And he, he comes to the microphone, and he says, no, no, no. He goes, guys, we're all old. Sit down. <laughs> 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 it's fine. <laughs> that was so great and we all did <laughs> oh that's funny uh I, so yeah i saw him at the old concert hall mm -hmm. at uh what is that davenport and young and with michelle shocked opening and oh, wow. uh he was he was for the people who don't know him billy bragg is very english and pretty socialist leaning and mm. pretty interesting guy he preached a little bit, sang a little bit, and, and was really good. And, and uh, but just a character. Oh, he. But this yeah. song, this song, "Greetings to the New Burnett, Yeah, I think it's one of the the great love songs of all time. That's a romp, and one of my favorite lines of all time is in that song. It's like, 
I celebrate my love for you with a pint of beer and a new tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not love a line like that? It puts a smile on your face and uh, it's just, it's just a, a classic, happy song. Uh, and it's a great sing-along song and uh, lots of fun. That's why I like it so much. Johnny Marr uh, from Smith's plays on this. And I think that... Chris... I, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, he really? does. Yeah. Wow. And... Um, Christy McCall sings on this, I believe. Christy, yeah, she, yeah, from yeah, Fairy she sang a couple of Billy Bragg. She sang in a couple of Billy Bragg songs over the years for sure. Yeah, um, the, the biggest did her own version of a New England, right? Yeah, but Johnny Marr. If I didn't know that, I'd certainly forgotten. But I, well, now when I think of the song, I think of the the guitar on the song. It certainly sounds like Johnny oh, Marr. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Wild Rivers is next. And thinking about love. I'm not super familiar with this one. So Wild Rivers, I put this in because this, in my mind, might be the next big Canadian band. Mm. Surprisingly, they have over 400 million plays on Spotify alone. Oh, wow. Um, and most people have never heard of them. They don't, they don't get radio airplay, but they've toured all over. I happen, I've happened to have met them, and, and they're very nice people as well mm -hmm. they were actually just uh, nominated for Juno for uh, upcoming or breakout act or something like that wow it's really interesting to me because they have over 400 million plays and that song itself thinking about love which is a a, a great sing-along song and in, in concert as well mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, this is a folk pop band in the spirit of old James Taylor or the Abbott brothers now oh wow uh, someone like that and I like that. and if, if you think about it, I looked at the statistics on Spotify. Mm -hmm. They have about four and a half million monthly listeners. Right? Wow. Just to give perspective, the biggest band in Canada right now is probably Arc Helps. Yeah. A Canadian band. They have 500,000 monthly listeners. Oh. Okay. So thinking about love, I think there's three versions on, the, on Spotify. It probably has 100 million plays. I think the biggest Arc Helps song is about... 15 million, which is Leather Jacket. Yeah. I don't want to downplay the Arkells at all because I think they're fantastic. And I, I, but I just want, you know, you think of a Arkells who, are, who can sell out Scotiabank and, and, and the, <laughs> an Iverwind Stadium or whatever it's called now and, and Hamilton uh, are fantastic, but they're very Canada based, whereas Wild Rivers has way more listeners, but it's more international, not just in Canada. So, which is why they have so many more plays. So they've toured Europe and uh, the U.S. They just toured Europe and U.S. and Canada in the last year. And they're probably the quietest, quietest ever sellout of Massey Hall last June. Yeah. <laughs> and, I... and, uh, and, and most Canadians have really haven't heard of them. I hadn't. It's, that's, a, that, that's a funny thing. You know, I was talking to a guy who, he's a producer, but he's also got a band called The Commoners quite good okay. but he said you, they can't get arrested in canada they they tour europe and play huge venues they're they're on planet rock in the uk yeah. canada just it's 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 such a strange thing that they can go abroad and and kill and they come out yeah. to canada and, and they're non-existent well and and these guys i mean they sold out massey hall so they're they're doing pretty well mm. um, and 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 i think they're they're playing they're playing the same size. They're playing, you know, uh, 500 seat venues all over the place. They're not, they're not selling at arenas in Europe or, or uh, in North America, mm -hmm. they're, but they're, but they're playing everywhere and, and they're expanding. And I, and I think that if they were independent when thinking about love came out and I think if they're now on network, I believe. And I, I think if they had been, on a, uh, a label when this song came out, it probably would have been a big hit for them. Okay. Um, well, in, in Canada, but you know, so they have to they have to come up with another hit that maybe gets more uh, radio love or you know television love or something mm -hmm. like main, main, mainstream love. Have a listen; they're a really interesting band. Uh, they've got two lead singers, uh, Khalid and uh, Devon, uh, man and woman. And it's a three piece that tours as a five piece, and I think that they they've got lots of uh, potential going forward. Cool. No, I'm definitely going to check them out for sure. I think you're onto something here, Chris. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Now your last song, I'm going to venture a wild guess here. <laughs> and the artist's name is Steph Sysom. 
The song is called New Brunette. Now, is there a relation by chance? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, this is my this is my daughter. Okay. And uh, I, and I put it on in this list because obviously of, of all the music on this list that I love, this is the one I'm most proud of. And mm. she's uh, whereas I'm a a lover of music and the music business and everything about it. I have zero musical talent <laughs> and she can sing and play instruments and write songs. And she's been doing that. So she's, uh, she's put out a few songs under Steph Sysom and, and a few others under um, uh, her pseudonym, a girl named Steve. Ah. So I love this song because it, it's, it's sort of an homage to uh Greetings to New Brunette. Yeah. So whereas Greetings to New Brunette is a you know a fantastic romp of a love song, uh, New Brunette by Steph Sysom is sort of a romp of a breakup song. Mm-hmm. So it's it's the opposite, and to me it's uh, it, it it's really a, a fun romp as well, where it talks about I hope your New Brunette enjoys the shoes I left, etc. It's kind of I love that fun and funny. Yeah, cool tie-in. That's great. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Good way to end the list. This is uh, this has been a good chat, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Brent. Thanks for uh, reaching out. It, uh, it's been fun, and, and it's fun to think about all this, and uh, really enjoyed it. Well, you know, you had a difficult time. Well, you, you snuck six in, but you had a difficult time. <laughs> five. But, like, put five more together, and, and, and we'll do it again. You know, people say it, it's impossible to just narrow yeah. it down to five, right? So people come back to the show often with a new list. So you're absolutely welcome anytime. Oh, great. Well, thanks so much. Great chatting with you. Great chatting with you. Yeah, keep in touch. Okay, Brian. All right. Take care. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, this has been No Sleep Till Sudbury with Brian Jensen and my very special guest, Mr. Chris Sison. Till next time, folks. Take good care. Brent Jensen is the best-selling author of No Sleep Till Separate, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon Worldwide.